was a trip on a dark hood And they were driving round and round Welcome to another video. This is going to be a Captain Beefheart special. I'm going to be showing you the new uh, 4 LP box set <coughs> which uh, came through the mail a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to be giving you some needle drops on it. I'm going to be showing you what it's like inside uh, but more importantly I'm going to be doing a video on Captain Beefheart. This is something which um, I haven't seen done yet. Um, it doesn't mean that nobody's done it, it just means I haven't seen it done. And um, I can't quite believe I've I've kind of left it so long to do it. Um, it may surprise some people to know that I am a, a fairly big Captain Beefheart fan from back in the day. I wouldn't say I was a, a Beefheart obsessive, certainly not an expert, um, but um, I, I spent a lot of time listening to his music back in the 1990s and um, I've been getting or I've been wanting to get reacquainted with it and um, it was actually Dean Grandma's handbag who alerted me to the existence of this box set. I'm really pleased I did. It's an excellent box set and um, it's uh, really nice quiet pressings, great sound, it's been remastered. So I'm going to talk you through what's in here like I said and then just give you a bit of bit of history and discussion on Beefheart, what I think of him and, and what my connection to him is and so on. So before further ado, let me just quickly run you through the contents of this because I know that there, there will be some people who tuned in just to see the box set and don't want to hear me rambling on. So for the benefit of those people, we have a booklet which contains some pictures and text. There's a little poem by Tom Waits and a couple of essays. Then we have the album Lick My Decals Off Baby. None of these come with any inserts. We have Spotlight Kid. We have Clear Spot. And then finally we have this album of um, outtakes which has a lovely bit of artwork on there from the good captain himself <laughs> and the whole thing just comes in a box so I do I do recommend it heartily both to Beefheart fans and anybody who's curious um, about him so yeah Captain Beefheart um, He's one of these artists who, he's a bit of, well, he's a lot of an outsider, you know, I don't hear a great deal of conversation about him out there on, you know, on YouTube, on the VC, and um, he's somebody that has been really influential on, on lots of artists that people do like, you know, so if you take, you know, people like Tom Waite, for example, uh, or, you know, Kate Bush, um, lots and lots of different people have been influenced by him, and you know, those people get a lot of attention, Beefheart less so. One of the reasons for that is, is his complete and utter weirdness. Um, he kind of had his own style of music, which is an understatement of the century. And I think some people feel a bit intimidated, maybe having heard of his reputation or having heard snatches of his music here and there and thinking to themselves, this isn't really for me. It's, it's a bit too weird. It's a bit too strange. And, uh, there's a kind of weird sort of attitude that some people have towards him where um, people who profess themselves to be fans of his can sometimes be accused of being pretentious um, or even stupid. I've heard at least one person out in YouTube land making a brief comment about Beefheart saying something like, if you, th if you think Trout Mask Replica is good, then you're clearly an idiot. Um, you know, to which I have a certain response um, I think you can guess what that is 
but it's it's perfectly true to say that, that he is he is kind of a difficult artist but i think by the same token i think people make too much of that i think um you know it's not that his weirdness has been overstated it's more that his weirdness is uh much more likable and enjoyable than people actually think um, so i first became aware of him uh when in the 90s i read a book it was the it was the autobiography of john lydon from sex pistols and pill and he kept mentioning this name beefheart all the time captain beefheart then I also read an interview with Andy Partridge from XTC who said that he had been lent a copy of Troutmouse Replica when he was a teenager and when he first heard it he thought it was just a complete nightmare, you know, a complete cacophony. Um, but then he gradually, he, he kept listening to it and listening to it and then he gradually started to realise that what sounded like a big improvised mess was actually very very tightly arranged and composed and he said at that moment it just kind of blew his mind and um, that was hugely influential on his musical approach in XTC. Now back in the day I was I was going around and I was trying to educate myself about music and the history of music I was, I was listening to everything you know and I had tapped into the blues already and I had tapped into certain kind of jazz. Um, I'd heard Ornette Coleman the um, jazz player who'd done a kind of, um, who sort of revolutionised jazz by taking it back to a very freeform kind of approach. And then I'd also heard Howlin' Wolf too, the great blues artist. And um, I heard that Captain Beefheart was a kind of mixture of the two. He had the big, deep, gravelly um, Howlin' Wolf voice, but he also had the cacophonous aspect of uh, Ornette Coleman. Although interestingly, Beefheart's music was never improvised. It was always very, very tightly uh, written, composed, arranged. He would actually compose the music often on a piano, which he didn't know how to play. And then he would he would play the parts for you know various bandmates who would then painstakingly learn the pieces that he'd written on the piano, all the different parts, you know. Or he would whistle the tunes or he would play them on a, a brass instrument such as a saxophone and the band would, would have to learn these songs and so I was very curious to hear all this so I went out and I bought the album that most people start with which is Trout Mass Replica and um, this was a kind of Mount Everest for me I decided I was going to conquer it I put it on my Walkman and I lived with it for at least a month I listened to nothing else listened to it and listened to it and listened to it and sure enough Sooner or later, I started to tap into the method behind the madness, and that quickly led to a bit of a love affair with Beefheart. I traced back and got his first album, um, Safe as Milk, which features Ry Cooder on guitar. This one is more of a kind of traditional blues rock with a bit of British invasion and, and you know, psych. He gradually got weirder as time went on. Strictly personal on CD, I haven't cracked the seal on that one yet, that's quite a new purchase. Um, this is a twofer, this is the Spotlight Kid and Clear Spot. So these are all CDs I've had you know, for years and years. This is the album that saw him trying to take a more commercial direction. This is Blue Jeans and Moonbeams, which is quite a nice album, but it's fairly uncharacteristic of Beefheart. Um, if people are nervous about Beefheart, I'd recommend they start with this record, actually, because it's easily his most commercial one. It's quite Van Morrison-esque in places. And we have Doc at the Radar Station, which goes back to just kind of mad beat poetry with uh, a big swirling cacophony of instruments behind him. Uh, we have um, Shiny Beast, Bat Chain Puller, and the, la and the last one I have is uh, Ice Cream for Crow. So, yeah, Beefheart's music, you can't pretend that it's just easy as anything to get into you know it, it, it's not but there's two things I'd say about it that people often miss one is his sense of humor you know Beefheart's music is always very um, light-hearted you know he was a he was a by all accounts he was a great guy he was an, a keen ecologist he was really interested in saving the planet you know in the environment he was also a poet and he was also an artist and he had a very very quirky way of doing things he was completely untutored never had a musical lesson in his life never learned to play a scale on the piano or the saxophone but he didn't let that stop him so um Beefheart's music is a kind of 
at its most extreme, it is a tangle of apparently unrelated parts, which are all clashing with each other in a strange way, but also making a weird kind of sense. And what this was all about was Beefheart, Don Van Vliet was his name. His mission was to try and short circuit the way people listen to music. You know, his idea was that people came to music with a certain set of expectations as to what music was and, and how they should go about listening to it. And he wanted to completely subvert that and try and create a kind of music which was <clears throat> constantly changing all the time. So you could never kind of grasp hold of it. You could never slip into a groove or a beat or get too comfortable. Um, it was an attempt to stop the listener's mind from fixating. And um, this information comes from a very good beef art biography I've got, which I've forgotten to bring onto camera. So I'll show that at the end. He was aware that to hear his music, the conscious part of the mind needed to be put on hold to allow it to come out rather than the listener getting in a sweat trying to figure it out. So um, much in the same way that the, that the surrealists attempted to short circuit people's kind of jaded traditional expectations of what reality was, Beefheart's uh, idea was to try and shock people, startle people into you know new ways of hearing, and um, he's, after the first album, you know frequently his music just completely carved out its own territory, didn't obey any of the usual rules. Having said that, it was it was located from a particular tradition, which broadly speaking was was kind of blues and R and B. So let's just quickly go through, and I'll give, just give you a bit of background. Um, Don Vlan Vliet, or Vliet, was born in California in 1941 and he died on December the 17th, 2010. He was a child prodigy uh, whose animal sculptures were featured on TV when he was four. He first discovered he was creative when he started carving animals out of the soap uh, in the bathroom of his parents' house. When he was 13, his parents then moved to Lancaster in California and that's where he soon met Frank Zappa, who would be a kind of crucial touchstone for him in his career. You know, Zappa produced Trapmas Replica and he formed his first band in 64. The first album was Safe as Milk uh, and that was a kind of mixture of desert blues, California rock, psych, British invasion and so on. Second and third albums, Strictly Personal, Mirror Man. Then he did Trapmas Replica in 69. Legend has it that he wrote all the music on the piano in about eight and a half hours and then he kind of taught it to the band and he rehearsed his band in this in this weird kind of situation where he sort of locked them all in this house for about nine months or something and just made them rehearse all these mad tunes and you know they, and they almost went mad you know he was sort of um, a, a real kind of taskmaster and he wanted them to, to have a completely self-contained world in order to to create this music and then the album was then produced by Zappa and he he had the services of this incredible band you know Bill Harkle Road on guitar and flute, Jeff Cotton on steel guitar, Victor Hayden otherwise known as the Mascara Snake on bass clarinet, he was Don's cousin, Mark Boston on bass, the incredible drumming of John French and if there's any one reason to listen to Beefheart if you're a drummer or if you're interested in if you're interested in drums or rhythm sections you need to check out John French's drumming you know absolutely amazing um, a kind of tangle of rhythms and disconnected grooves and just the weirdest sounding drum rhythms that have ever been put to tape and uh, nobody since him really has ever tried to do drum parts like that you know I mean they they sound random but they they're kind of intricately plotted and then John himself the captain, he played bass clarinet, tenor and soprano sax. And like I said, he was completely untutored, so you hear a lot of honking and squawking and so on. And now Trap Mass got to number 21 in the UK charts, didn't chart in the US. And in fact, that was a kind of pattern that went on through his career. Um, he did start to have some lower chart placings later on in the US, but it was, it was in the UK that he was really popular as a cult artist, largely as a result of John Peel, the famous DJ who absolutely idolised um, Captain Beefheart and was a friend of his and, and you know played his music all through the years and that that's certainly where people like John Lydon would have heard his music. So anyway, so this was the sequel to Trap Mass Replica. This is Lick My Decals Off Baby. Um, 
it was recorded in the summer of 1970 uh, at United Recording, Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Uh, it's been described by Matt Groening from The Simpsons fame as a sloppy cacophony. And that goes back to, I think, what Andy Partridge said. When you first hear this music, it sounds like a completely unrehearsed mess. And it takes a fair bit of listening to kind of clue into the fact that it's actually been tightly written, composed, rehearsed. So what you have is kind of, you know, whipping hi-hats, uh, a completely chaotic undergrowth of bass and guitars, angular riffs bouncing off each other. It sounds like everybody's going off in all directions at once, but it somehow meshes together um, with the intricacy of a kind of tangled mass of barbed wire. Yeah, I want to swallow you whole, and I want to lick you everywhere it's pink, in everywhere you think, rather than I want to hold you. shot for this album was taken on a Warner Brothers soundstage uh, from a movie called Hotel and the band had been rehearsing in this place and uh, so that's quite an interesting shot and the back cover features a poem and a painting by um, by the good captain and Vliet himself he considered this his finest album but it's a fairly extreme one. It's not one that I would recommend you go to if you're kind of completely new to Beef Heart. It was much in the style of Trap Mask Replica, but it was much more concise. You know, Trap Mask is a double album. It's very long, it's very sprawling. This one is, is much kind of tighter. Trap Mask was, was produced by Zappa, whereas this was actually produced by uh, Captain Beef Heart himself. So that's uh, Lick My Decals Off Baby, which has been unavailable for years you know I mean there was a CD release of it many years ago I actually have an OG of it from you know back in the day but this is the first re-release it's had in a long time okay so moving on we now move on to uh, Spotlight Kid which was recorded at the record plant in LA released in January of 1972 it was Melody Maker's album of the month it charted at 44 in the UK and 131 in the US the first time that um, a Beefheart album had charted uh, in the States. Now this is an interesting album. Beefheart had recently got married and was trying to make his music slightly more conventional, maybe to sort of appeal to the ladies in the audience, but he didn't take it too far. We had to wait for the next album for that to really, you know, come into fruition. Zero checks. One go ahead. And the other one coming back Maybe on that old train I say, come back, come back, baby, come back Back Which side of your head oh you who wear your heart Clean up the air and treat the animals fair features the good captain in a dandy suit from the LA rodeo tailors whose list of candidates included Hank Williams and Elvis Presley uh, and it's an absolutely lovely suit but apparently he blew most of the advance for the album on the suit. 
So the band were not terribly happy when they found out that they were going to be taking home uh, a lesser amount of money because he'd, he'd just kind of blown all the cash on this. Um, but, okay, and the rear cover features some rather strange drawings by Beefheart himself. And his, you know, his art was very much an accompaniment to his music. What you see with his art is kind of, you know, a pictorial representation for what you hear in his music. The next album uh, was Clear Spot, and this was the one where he kind of started to go commercial. This record is produced by uh, Ted Templeton, who had produced the Doobie Brothers, Little Feet and Van Morrison. This is my favourite Beefheart album. It still retains a lot of what made him original and unique, it has a kind of groove that runs through it. The, the, uh, the, the instruments sound better, there's a, there's a kind of... The, there's a sheen on the instruments. It just sounds more sophisticated. There's a greater depth of sound. Aren't you find out the circumstances the captain doing a slightly different kind of composition. He'd stopped composing on the piano and he was allowing the band to have more input. So a fair few of the songs on this record uh, were kind of jammed into existence by the band based on melodic ideas which had been uh, hummed to them or played on a saxophone and that might be why this record is uh, slightly easier to get into than some of his very extreme work where it's just all him or he's composed it on the piano He's created these intricate, very strange, dissonant harmonies and then he's literally taught that to the band and the band have had to learn it note by note. This, this record is more organic. The final thing to show you then is just the album of outtakes. This is pretty good, it contains stuff from right across his career. There are some alternative versions, um, there are some instrumental cuts, instrumental takes of tracks that you know from um, other albums. I'm not going to go through all the tracks, if you want to see what's on it you can go onto Amazon you can read some of the reviews that are on there I wouldn't say this was kind of indispensable I enjoyed it but the main reason I bought the box set was to get the um, you know was to get the original albums so um, yeah Captain Beefheart I would recommend if you haven't got round to him yet you know if you like Tom Waits um, if you like Sonic Youth, if you like The Clash, if you like Pill, a lot of independent music in the 80s as well. You know, Beefheart's musical legacy is, is woven very deeply through a lot of alternative music. And the one thing that I just want to stress again is that he's not as forbidding as people think. I mean, you know, like I said before, don't start with that record. My absolute recommendation would be, unless you want to go really kind of easy and start with something very, very smooth and commercial for him, in which case you can go for Blue Jeans and Moonbeams. The record that I would go to first, to hear his strangeness, but done in a more commercial uh, way, I would recommend the album Clear Spot. And um, I would say with Beefheart, you know, don't be scared of him. 
Um, if you tap into the humour, there's a great deal of joy and discovery to be found in his music. Listening to Beefheart always always cheers me up. You know, it, it's so bouncy and actually funky is the one thing I forgot to mention. Beefheart's music is always funky. There's a funk there because he was very influenced by a lot of early R&B. So, so there's a funkiness in his music, there's an earthiness, there's certainly a bluesiness with that great kind of growling voice and those guitars. Great guitar sounds, great arrangements, great songwriting, great poetry, great art. He was the deal, he was the package. Don Van Vliet, Captain Beefheart. Thanks for watching. Baby, hey, all you young girls, what you do?